or you know, one of these times we're going to have a goodly amount of time for um, questions. So we're going to hit that mark this time because we, we have run out of time in the past. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Rebecca Power, the Interim Director of the North Central Region Water Network and your host for this um, webinar, The Current. Uh, this is the North Central Region Water Network's speed networking webinar series. Um, its purpose is to increase your access to excellent extension programming and research that uh, we hope will be useful to you in your own work across, um, across the region or the country, wherever you happen to be joining us from. The format of this the session will be four 10-minute presentations with questions and discussion at the end. Um, and all the webinars are archived on our North Central Region Water Network website at northcentralwater.org. So you can uh, find them there yourself or refer other people to them if you think it would be um, uh, worth it for them to take a look at. Our topic today is aquatic invasive species impacts and resources. Uh, and this is the fifth uh, in our series. I'll just give you a little preview. The next webinar will take place on November 19th. It's always the third Wednesday of the month and always 2 p.m. Central Time. And the topic for that session will be the 21st Century Extension Educator Resources for Multi-State Collaboration. So there are a few tips up here in the first slide for a good experience. Um, I'm, most of these are uh, only useful for you if you happen to be asking a question. So um, I won't worry about asking you to run through the audio setup wizard right now, but if you have an audio problem, if you're trying to talk, that would be something to do. Um, please submit your questions for presenters via the chat box. We will harvest those questions and use them um, at the end, depending upon how many people we have. Uh, we'll start with the chat box, or if there aren't a lot of people, then we'll go ahead and ask you to ask your own question at the end. Um, if you want to ask a question uh, verbally at the end, you can go ahead and raise, raise your um, electronic hand, which should be right below your name or um, on the left, in the left-hand column, uh, there's a navigation bar there that has a hand for you to raise. All right. Okay, today's presentations, uh, uh, Peter Sorensen, University of Minnesota, As Ashley Baldridge from the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory in Ann Arbor, uh, Pat Charleboy from Illinois Indiana Sea Grants. I hope I said that right, Pat. <laughs> and uh, Doug Jensen from uh, the University of Minnesota Sea Grant. So uh, those will be our presenters today. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce Peter. And uh, he has a lovely bio here. Um, I'm not going to read all of that bio, but it was it was uh, had this lovely personal touch, which I appreciated. Just like um, and he is Dr. Goldfish. Yeah. <laughs> goldfish in uh, the, uh, the identifier area there. So if you have a question for him or want to chat with him, that would be the, the person to go to. So um, you know, Dr. Sorensen received his bachelor's degree from Bates College and a PhD in biological oceanography from the University of Rhode Island. Uh, and as a postdoc at the University of Alberta, he worked with Norm Stacy and identified some of the first sex pheromones uh, in fish, which has been a foundation for his future work. He came to the University of Minnesota in 1988 to study fish behavior, olfaction, and physiology. And uh, his enthusiasm certainly comes through in his presentation um, and in his bio here. So he's interested in working both on applied and uh, basic research topics and uh, invites you to contact him uh, if you share these interests. So that's one of the reasons we're having these webinars is so you all, um, people on the webinars uh, and in the audience can get to know uh, one another and, and figure out who might have some good information for you. So with that, Peter, take it away. Oh, well, thank you, thank you very much. Let me uh, move my slide thing here, I guess. Um, OK, so today I'm going to talk. I've been working with, uh, well, I worked with sea lamprey for 16 years, and then uh, since 2006, which is uh, about whatever that time is, 8, 10 years, I've been now working with, I guess not that long, with carps in particular, including goldfish. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, what are carp? Uh, they're basically large uh, riverine uh, minnows that, that taste kind of oily. Uh, they're not really a scientific grouping of fish at all, but uh, 
uh, sort of a group of these things that, uh, that happen to live in rivers. And there are three major types of carp. Uh, the Eurasian carps from Eurasia, obviously. Uh, Black Sea, Caspian Sea area, which includes the goldfish and the common carp, the Crucian carp. And then there's the Asian carp from, uh, from um, Asia, uh, China, Vietnam, which are now invading the U.S. Uh, common carp have been here, though, since the 1800s. And they're Indian carps, which haven't made it to the U.S. yet, fortunately. So today we're mostly going to talk about uh, common uh, Eurasian carp and with a little bit at the end on Asian carp. Uh, common carp, uh, like I said, were introduced uh, by the predecessor, predecessor of the uh, U.S. Fish and Fishery Wildlife Service at the request of the citizens of our citizens after a huge congressional letter writing campaign in the 1880s. So they were a successful governmental introduction, which uh, unsuccessfully um, resulted in huge uh, economic and ecological uh, devastation across the country. I would uh, submit there are worst invasive fish at the present time, with the possible exception of sea lamprey, but sea lamprey are controlled. The common carp are uh, occupied in largely shallow lakes and rivers and some deeper lakes across the entire U.S. Um, and they can comprise up to two-thirds of the biomass of many of these lakes, and uh, including the Midwest. It seems like all of our present group is from the Midwest. So this applies to Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, Ohio. Anyway, they can be usually uh, damaging in those areas. Um, and they, uh, what they do is they feed on the bottom. And uh, they've been doing this for uh, 100 years. Most people don't even realize the extent of the damage they're causing. They uproot all the plants uh, to get at the insects and so forth. Uh, common carp are extremely fecund, like Asian carp, maybe several million eggs per female. They migrate into shallows to spawn, um, a little bit unlike Asian carp that spawn in the middle river. Like Asian carp, the eggs and larvae then grow very quickly. They live to be very old like Asian carp, up to 70 years old, and they have this usually devastating effects in which they rework entire ecosystems. Um, we've been studying them. Uh, people have been wondering what to do about them for a very long period of time. And they've been a good model for us for, frankly, uh, understanding invasive fish in general. And now I think Asian carp. But we'll get to that at the end. People have pursued all the obvious things, uh, rotenone poisoning, um, like people have tried with other invasive fish. Uh, uh, usually doesn't work, except for TFM for lamprey, where they're restricted to very special areas. Uh, fishing out, uh, drawdowns, and uh, anyway, these have been going on for decades and decades. Uh, and uh, in 2006, my lab started working on uh, common carp. And we realized people didn't even really know how many there were, what kind of damage they were causing, let alone how to control them. So today I'm going to speak just a little bit about a large sort of effort we've had underway for some, for some time. Um, very briefly, uh, and it's important to understand that we felt before you could even start to control a species, and I've got to tell you this information is not really available for Asian carp, not in much detail. We felt we had to know how many they were. So we started out by saning entire lakes and uh, doing mark capture and releasing these fish to come up with population estimates. And that is important because if you're going to do removal, you'll never get them all out. So you have to know what it means when you remove a certain number or not. So that's why we did this data. Now, that's another story how we did that. But we've done that. We also felt as we need to know how they were moving across the environment. If you were to trap and remove them, where are the weak links? Where are the spots that they aggregate are particularly vulnerable? Where do they spawn? Again, uh, cutting to the chase, uh, one of the things we discovered, uh, we discovered the spawning area. That's another, another uh, sort of seminar. But for this, this, uh, this seminar, one of the things we discovered, and of course commercial fishermen knew about it for years, was that these fish tend to aggregate remarkably and very strongly in the winter time. And this slide you're looking at here right now is an aggregation of carp in Lake Riley. You see 20 red dots. Those are radio tagged fish. And they represent a population of about 5,000 adult carp in there, most of which were 30, 40 years old, as a matter of fact. They had no idea how to get them out. Um, I'm going to skip through this slide because I see we're going through time. So we started to institute then a control program. And this we're preparing to publish now. But we've actually 
uh, figured out how to control the recruitment. That's another topic. But we were able to do this with native fish, as a matter of fact. And once you can control the recruitment and production of a fish, then it makes sense to remove the adults, because then you basically plug the hole in the boat. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So what we wondered in particular was, and this was an idea we stole from the Australians, was whether we could use radio tagged fish, fish um, that uh, were marked uh, and to, as indicators of where the population was. And this technique was developed for goats, actually on tropical islands, to get goat herds off, you know, that the Brits had left there in the 1700s. The idea is that you have a social species, you can mark and track them as they go to others and betray the location of the group. And so that's what we started doing with these uh, radio tagged fish. And we found that, as I said, we'd already known that they aggregated, and then particularly in the winter months. So we had these aggregations. You see this a map here of a lake, Lake Susan. And uh, basically, three quarters of the population aggregated one uh, spring, which we located with um, radio tags. And we hired commercial fishermen. We were able to remove 80% of the population one afternoon there, uh, which is pretty efficient because the alternative is chasing them around like cats or something like that uh, in a very untargeted way. In Lake Riley, uh, very fortunately, almost the entire population actually happened to aggregate. These are just a few examples of many. In one bay, and we got the entire population in one afternoon. And this all made sense because when we removed, in this case, about 3,000 fish, we knew that was 95% of the population. So we knew what that meant. We knew we didn't have to go back. There's no point in doing this, I don't believe, unless you know how many you're trying to get. If you don't get a lot, you can go back kind of thing. So we we're able to do this with these Judas fish then to lead us to that. And these systems now are under control. We've been able to uh, suppress the common carp. And I, I don't show the data here, but it now goes out to 2014. We've got the numbers down to less than 50 kilograms per hectare, which is below ecologically damaging levels without using any poisons, just by stopping recruitment. That's another restoring fisheries, basically, in this Judas fish technique for the adults. So the question was, and that was kind of how I got into this, was whether we could automate this technique, because it's a lot of work. Uh, it's not so much radio tagging fish, but actually following them around, because we still don't understand exactly where and when they might aggregate. So we've been collaborating, and that's uh, with a computer science group at the University of Minnesota. It's interested in search and rescue, and we've developed these robotic boats. And that's what you see here is a little robotic boat. You see a radio tag, uh, radio antenna on the top that swivels. And these boats can, there's, a, there's an address down below, so you can go to that website, and uh, they'll show you how it works. But they can go out as teams, and they can do search. And, and basically, they can find the uh, radio tag fish for us and report it back. And it's kind of cool, frankly. And uh, so we don't have to have lots of, well, we don't have to employ students. So they like employing students to go out and do it. And that's the premise of this. Now, I've got to tell you, the drawback is uh, this works. They, they, uh, this, boats actually have little computers on board, and their softwares or algorithms that they've written to do search and rescue routines, so they or search for routines, and they can find these fish very effectively in all kinds of conditions. The big drawback is that they run out of power. Although they've tried solar power, and they sometimes get caught in weeds, so they're not really ready for implementation yet. We still hire students, but you can see where this has a lot of potential. It's pretty interesting. And they've even developed a robot that actually operates on ice, because the fish tend to aggregate mostly in the winter. And uh, so if you have robots working on ice uh, that can work together, that's uh, pretty effective. This is funded by the National Science Foundation. It's been a lot of fun and very interesting. Uh, these robots work pretty well, too, although if there's deep snow, it's like works in December, but not January. Let's put it that way. So we've done that. Now, very briefly, I'll just, I guess I've run out of time. I'll just say, what about the Asian carp? That, I mean, the common carp around here are the problem, although most people are focused on Asian carp. Uh, it's so upsetting to see them jumping. But they, too, uh, are large migratory fish, very fecund, and they seem to aggregate, although that's not well studied. So the question is, can we use these kind of techniques for the Asian carp? And uh, we think probably, and we're now starting to develop 
uh, Judas fish techniques using sterilized fish uh, to release, uh, we hope, in the Mississippi River to help us find them out there. And if we had a robotic boat, uh, that would be very useful. So take home, basically, is that carps are serious problems, particularly the common carp, and that targeted removals, if combined with recruitment control, uh, are already proving to be very uh, useful and interesting. So that's my two cents. Uh, I hang around now, right, till the end? And yes, please. Questions. Yes, please. That would be great. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Yep, thank that. you so much, I'll Peter. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's move on to Ashley Baldrich. And uh, I'll advance the slides here to Ashley's uh, uh, bio. Ashley um, is obviously not with the university, but is with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab in Ann Arbor. Uh, Noah's been a great partner to us on um, Great Lakes issues. She has a, a bachelor's degree in biology from the Michigan Technological University and a master's degree in ecology from Smith College, and finally a PhD in ecology from the University of Notre Dame. Uh, the common theme of her research is food web interactions between native and invasive species and how these interactions might be influenced by climate. Take it away, Ashley. Hey, great. Uh, thank you for that, Rebecca. So today is following the theme of, uh, following the theme of today's presentation. Um, I'm going to first talk about impacts, uh, research we've done on the impacts of an invasive species, and also just present some resources that we have here at NOAA, which is an invasive species database that's a very useful tool for educators, researchers, and managers. So uh, for my research, what I'll present today, the, the title shown here, and this is actually work I did as a postdoc in, over this last year uh, with the Water Center in Siler, which is housed at the University of Michigan. And I very recently started my position here at NOAA. So, um, oh, sorry. Yep. so to first talk about these kind of two main stretches on the Great Lakes, the first is invasive species. There are a large number of non-indigenous species that have been introduced to the Great Lakes Basin. And this is primarily through um, being introduced in ballast water of ships entering the basin. But then once species are here, the Great Lakes can serve as um, kind of a beachhead for invasions and secondary spread into the inland waters of US and Canada. So it's very important that we understand the impacts of species once they arrive in the basin. And by knowing the impacts, we can know what to anticipate and apply to secondary spread and help prioritize species for management to um, prevent that spread. Another stressor then I mentioned is climate change. And in the Great Lakes, uh, the, we have documented increasing surface temperatures. And this map here that was produced by the GLEAM project shows that um, higher temperature increases in the upper, mid uh, upper Great Lakes area, but we still have low levels in the southern part of the basin. And with these increasing surface temperatures, they can think of it as spring is coming earlier. We may have more mild winters, with the exception of this last winter, of course. And spring comes earlier, the temperature starts to get warmer sooner. And then once the top layer of the water warms up, distinct temperature layers form in the lake. This is known as stratification. And this keeps the whole water column from mixing. And it creates a, a defined thermal structure within the lake. So if the timing of this is changing, it's just changing the whole environment for the plankton that live in the lakes. So plankton can have uh, different responses to this changing stratification. I have a simplified food web here that shows the um, phytoplankton of different sizes and zooplankton of different sizes. And when you have earlier stratification, that can cause an earlier spring phytoplankton bloom. Now, the way the, the zooplankton may not be responding at the same time, which can put some species of zooplankton out of sync then with their primary food source. So if the phytoplankton is blooming a lot sooner, then maybe Daphnia that come in mid-season might find um, less food to eat. So these impacts can move up the food chain and ultimately affect fish. So again, looking at this food web diagram here, in the lower left, we see a Dreissena mussel. And you can see that there are many connections of this mussel with the different phytoplankton groups. And um, 
for the for this talk and looking at um, the stress of invasive species, I've focused a lot on the stress of dracaenid mussels, and particularly in Lake Michigan. Uh, these this panel of of graphs here shows the increase in Dracaena biomass over time. And this is for both zebra mussels, which is the black line, and quagga mussels, which is the dashed line. And it's broken up into four different depth categories. And I just want to point out that it's really in this 30 to 50 meters and also the 50 to 90 meters where we see this really extreme growth in biomass for quagga mussels. And that's where we've seen a lot of, of impacts from them in the lakes. And they have very well documented negative impacts on the phytoplankton. So for my question, where I wanted to look at the relative impacts of dracaenid mussels and um, climate change on the zooplankton, I really have the benefit of having access to some great um, data sources through NOAA. On the first, I'll point out we have these, this NOAA buoy as well as a thermistor that's in the middle of the central basin. And this allows us to track temperature. Um, the buoy has been present. We have data from 1990 to present. So it really allows us to see trends over time. And the thermistor string goes down into the water, which helps us understand the thermal structure of the, the water throughout the season. And then we also have benthic surveys for bu mus muscle biomass. And these surveys are conducted at uh, 40 sites throughout this southern basin. And this produces the data that I just presented on that previous slide. And then this long-term collection site, as we've been collecting zooplankton, chlorophyll, and water temperature in these areas off the coast of Muskegon since 1990s. Now, to analyze the data, I've been using path analysis. It's a way to analyze complex causal links between variables. And here, this conceptual model is reflecting a simple food web. And it's showing the relationship, Dracaenids affecting phytoplankton, the um, kind of predator-prey relationship between phytoplankton and zooplankton, and then going up to predatory zooplankton. And then we also consider the temperature effects on each of these levels in the food web. And I want to emphasize that predatory zooplankton is the top of the food chain here. We just don't have the good data on fish. So that's as um, predatory zooplankton is as far as we go. But that would definitely be a future um, direction for this research. And from this, we can get see the um, relative strengths of the relationships. So main conclusions from this study um, and our preliminary conclusions are that for phytoplankton, both dracaenid mussels and the duration of stratification have negative effects on phytoplankton. And I want to emphasize that um, climate change is associated with longer duration of stratification. However, when you look at the relative strength of the two, dracaenid effect is stronger than the climate effect. For zooplankton, the higher temperatures within the season have a strong positive effect on zooplankton. Um, and this, I think, is explained by the oftentimes when you have peak temperatures during the summer that corresponds with, with peak zooplankton biomass. Um, the dracaenids have a negative effect on zooplankton, and it's a little more moderate. The duration of stratification is actually not significant on zooplankton, but I want to emphasize that this analysis was done on zooplankton as a whole. And looking to the future, we're very interested in combine, um, breaking it down and looking at zooplankton community composition instead of all zooplankton in an aggregate. Another thing we'd like to do moving forward is to look at um, climate effects on dracaenid mussels. The, the temperature environment, especially in the lake, deep lake, Lake Michigan, is going to be pretty consistent throughout the year. But um, so we don't expect that to change as much with climate change. But what will change is the quality and quantity of food that's going to be available to the mussels as a result of changing thermal structure. So we think that's where we'll, we'll find a lot um, of, of interesting answers in the future and could have implications for the future success of dracaenids. So with the time I have remaining, I want to switch over to talking about resources. And a, may, a very um, wonderful resource that we have through, that's hosted by NOAA is GLANSIS, the Great Lakes Aquatic Non-Indigenous Species Information System, which is focused on early detection, rapid response, and management. 
And this, I have the contact information on the bottom here. I have to give credit to Rochelle Sturdivant here who runs this program. She's the Great Lakes Sea Grant Extension Educator. And this is an interface for accessing Great Lakes specific content from the U.S. Geological Survey Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species Database. When you go and say all of that, I realize we, why we talk in acronyms so much because that's definitely a mouthful. But um, through this, we have advanced search capacity. So you're not just getting um, information about the species, but you can really um, sort and get information in a lot of different ways that allow you to see the patterns and particulars of these non-native uh, non species. There are recent enhancements for GLANSYS as a result of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and these are in the form of impact assessments, which consider environmental, socioeconomic, and, and beneficial aspects for each species. We look at range expansion species, which are ones that are native in one portion of the basin, but expanding and having invasive populations elsewhere. Uh, we now have watchlist species, which are species that are, have been identified as high risk for introduction or invasion in the Great Lakes. And, and I just want to point out, skipping to this last point here, there's a new field for management information, which will give regulatory and control information for each species. So I have just a moment left, and I am on my last slide here. So just to give you an idea of when you go to Glances, you see an interactive database search. You can put in your criteria for multiple fields. From this, you get your customized search results. For any species on that list, you can um, select it and look at comprehensive technical fact sheets. And I actually want to give a, a quick credit to Pat Charleboy who's on this call because she did a lot of work with the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant to contribute to these fact sheets. And then another useful tool you get are detailed collection records for each of these species. So overall, I know we just had a brief time here, but I hope I gave you a good quick overview of the type of research we're doing at NOAA for impacts and then these tools that are really available and um, for educators researchers and um, many, many people in the extension. So if you have any questions about GLANSYS in particular, you're welcome to contact me. Uh, I have my, again, my email is on the, um, I have my email on this last slide again. And I definitely want to give credit to my collaborators on these research projects as well as people who have provided additional support. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ashley. And just a reminder to um, participants in the webinar, uh, please put any questions that you have for our speakers in the chat box. So uh, Brian and uh, Martha and myself will be um, monitoring those questions and will help facilitate the conversation at, uh, after our speakers are finished. So, and, and Ashley uh, gave a nice nod to Pat there, so we'll go on to Pat Charleboy, our next speaker. And uh, Pat has been conducting aquatic invasive species outreach for Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and the Illinois Natural History Survey since 1996. She and her staff have developed comprehensive outreach programming for both Illinois and Indiana, focusing on invasion pathways, including recreational water use, water gardening, and classroom use of live specimens. Pat serves on several regional committees. Um, you can read them there. And she's also served as co-chair of the ANS task force committees that developed the National Water Gardening and Classroom AIS Prevention Guidelines. Pat earned her undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Notre Dame and is currently housed at the Chicago Botanic Garden with a beautiful place to go to work every day. So thanks, Pat, for joining us. And go right ahead. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, the project I'm going to talk about is one that um, it comes in a good place in the agenda, I think, because it bridges the research and the outreach. The project that Illinois Indiana Sea Grant has been working on, together with researchers at the University of Notre Dame, Loyola, University of Chicago, and uh, the Nature Conservancy. It started back in uh, the early 2000s in Indiana, when Indiana got infested, or one lake got infested with Brazilian Elmadilla, and then shortly thereafter, another lake was infested with Hydrilla. And Indiana DNR um, was spending lots of money, lots of effort on this. And they came to us and said, you know, this, this isn't sustainable. We can't do this. 
we need to pass some sort of regulations. But we also need to have, with these regulations, we need to have the industry and hobbyists and um, NGOs on board, or else it, it's not going to work. And so um, in the state, we brought together the academics that were working on um, similar projects at Notre Dame and the hobbyists and the industry, and we formed the Indiana Aquatic Plants and Trade Working Group. And one of the successes of this group, after lots of meetings and several years, is that we actually developed an aquatic plant risk assessment tool. This tool was based on um, some of the criteria that we had worked out over the years that we met in that it had to be science-based. It couldn't be just, you know, willy-nilly, well, I think this, this species will be bad, but it had to be actually based on science, had to be uh, transparent, and it had to be repeatable. So we um, used the New Zealand Aquatic Weed Risk Assessment Tool as our starting point because it had all of these qualifications that were um, important to this group. And it was also already in use and accepted, so it was, it was out there already and, and had gone through review. And it was developed specifically for aquatics, which was a bonus. And when we went through this, we modified it only when absolutely necessary because we didn't want to change the or affect the integrity of the, of the tool. And so we only changed it like to get rid of references to salt water, which obviously Indiana doesn't have any. So, um, so we used that tool and, and it's um, a question and answer tool. And this, I just wanted to show you one, one question example. So this question deals with seed production. And if it produces no seeds, it gets a score of zero. And if it produces a lot of seeds, it gets a score of three. So this tool is a series of questions like this that um, are, are the species is assigned a score for each of these questions. And then at the end, the individual question scores are summarized or summed, and this score, this total score, gives an idea of the invasiveness of the species. So the group developed this tool, and then Notre Dame went and used the tool to run through all of the plants that we knew of that at that time were in trade. And they came up with scores for each of those species and then a ranking for them in terms of their invasiveness. And then Indiana took this, this these rankings, and they created a regulatory a regulatory list from this. So with our success in Indiana, we thought, you know, could we do this for all of the Great Lakes and each of the um, Great Lakes states to protect the basin? And we wanted to look at this on a, on a region-wide basis because it, if you look at, at information like this that we had at that time, this is fish, invasive fish in the the text column here, and then the states across the top. So, and the X's indicate that that state has a regulation. For instance, Big Head Carp here has a regulation or is regulated in every state of the Great Lakes. The concern is, or the problem is, that there are all these blank spots where there are no regulations. So there are some regulations in some states and no regulations in other states. So if you look at Tench here, there's only, it's only regulated in Michigan. So the problem comes in, in that the system is connected, right? So if Tench were to make its way into Wisconsin, because of the connectivity of the system, they're eventually going to make their way into Michigan, even though they're regulated, and probably eventually all the way over here into New York. So we wanted to protect the whole basin, and so we wanted to develop tools that would work for all of the states in the basin. So we received funding from um, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to do this, to create seven or risk assessment tools for seven different taxa. And these tools are, are still being refined, I should say. The plants in the MOS tool are completely finished. And um, they vary in their construction. The plant tool, again, is a question answer type of tool. The MOS tool is statistical with a couple of questions added on to it. And then the others are, are various um, iterations of this. So we are developed the, these tools for the seven taxa. 
and then we're assessing all of the species in trade using these tools. And then one of Sea Branch roles is that then we will make those ass assessments available to consumers. So right now, only the again, only the plants and the mollusk tools are completed with all of the assessments run. So for the plant tool, what we we've created a couple tools or outreach tools. Um, one of them is this water garden poster. We have funding um, through another GLRI project that allowed us to do a survey of hobbyists. And these hobbyists told us that retail outlets are really important sources for information. So we developed this poster for posting in these retail outlets. And it's really just, um, you know, a, a, a poster. Can't give too much information. It's designed just to raise the issue. And this is being distributed by the Great Lakes Sea Grant Network. We also created this tip card that is for um, placement at the point of sale. And this is a wallet size card because we wanted people to carry this with them, have easy access to the information when they're making purchases. So you can see on this that it has, um, this is the back of the card, steps that people can take and directs to a website for more information. But more importantly, on the inside, it has the risk assessment outcomes, those species in black, that are okay to grow in the Great Lakes region, and those species in red that are likely invasive if they were being introduced. I asked the, the lead PI on this project, um, you know, the transfer, to give me an idea of the transferability of this information to other regions, say um, the other areas in the, uh, in the network. And he was comfortable saying that he thought that plants likely the plant tool and the plant assessments likely would translate as long as there was a climate match to the Great Lakes. So the information here could be a starting point for other um, areas in the, in the region, for other states in the region. For mollusks, we created this brochure. And again, the inside of the brochure has the risk assessment outcomes. We, have, we created this for distribution through pet aquarium stores. We'll also be giving this away at um, hobbyist events that we're doing throughout the, the Great Lakes region. And this one in particular is likely not transferable outside of the Great Lakes because there are some species that are only found in the Great Lakes at this time and aren't in inland waters. We also created this website, takeaim.org, AIM standing for Aquatic Invaders in the Marketplace. We developed this website as a one-stop shop for OIT information for the entire nation, actually. We designed it for managers, retailers, and consumers. Managers probably are most um, interested in the predictive tools or predictive resources that we have here. These are the Great Lakes um, tools developed by Notre Dame. The retailers. We developed a state and federal regulations database. We heard particularly from the biological supply houses that they had trouble keeping up to date on the regulations. And so we developed this database of this, all of the state and federal regulations that deal with aquatic species, put it into the searchable database. And then the rest of this is for consumers. You know, a little bit on the pathways, prevention steps, and alternatives. We hope to go live with this by um, November 1st. Help. We need help from people out there. We would love to have updates on state regulations as well as other OIT outreach products that we can put on this website. And there are other products out there. There are products developed for um, classrooms and teachers, ones for bait, for uh, water gardeners. And there's the National Habitatitude Campaign, which is a, a partnership of PJAC, the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council, Fish and Wildlife Service and um, Sea Grant is developed as a campaign. Um, there's a website that's being updated, which hopefully will be a great resource once it's finished. And several products have been developed as a result of this. So that's all I have. Um, I encourage you to use these products when you're talking to people or um, develop your own and then let us know about them. So thanks very much. Thanks, Pat. That's so modest. You know, that's, that's all I have, <laughs> just, just all those great resources. Thank you so much. And we'll move on um, to Doug 
Jensen. And again, uh, just a reminder for folks, if you do have a question, please put that in the chat box. And that is how we will uh, use it, um, get those questions at the end of the session for our presenters. So Doug has been coordinating the University of Minnesota's Sea Grant Aquatic Invasive Species Program for over 20 years. Lots of expertise there. He specializes in strategic planning, public outreach, and evaluation aimed at presenting, uh, preventing the spread of aquatic invasive species through behavior intervention. Doug's efforts uh, support two national campaigns, including Habitatitude uh, and Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers. Uh, he's published many papers. Uh, I'm going to move through this quickly so he can present. He serves as chair on several national and regional state task forces, honored with several awards that you can all read there. Uh, and on behalf of the Great Lakes National Sea Grant Network, he's heading the first ever comprehensive regional aquatic invasive species public education campaign, which we're so glad uh, to have here in the North Central region. He earned his master's degree in education and a BS in biology from the University of Minnesota Duluth. Thank you so much, Doug. Oh, uh, thank you, Rebecca. Can you hear me okay? You're good. All right. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, my pleasure to be here with you. I appreciate the invitation and thank uh, all of you that have uh, tuned into the webinar covering this extremely important topic of, uh, of aquatic invasive species. Uh, I'm excited to be here today uh, to share some of the latest research that shows that public education can be successful in helping to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. And as some of you know, Minnesota Sea Grant has been a leader in the assessment of, of AIS outreach for the past 20 years. And through these assessments, uh, we've learned a great deal about how to improve aquatic invasive species outreach and communication. Um, when it comes to aquatic invasive species, it's not necessarily about managing the species as much as it's about managing the pathways and getting folks who are at risk for spreading aquatic invasive species to take preventative action. And a campaign that Minnesota Sea Grant has been supporting since its inception is the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers National Education Campaign. And so through this presentation, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll learn a little bit more about the campaign, where to get resources, and how you can implement it. When thinking about how to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species through outreach, there's no use really inventing, reinventing the wheel. There's four successful national campaigns and programs that are already well established. Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers targets a variety of outdoor water recreationists. Habitatitude, as Pat has identified, is for Aquarius water gardeners, teachers, and students aimed at preventing release of unwanted pets, plants, and live study specimens in the environment. NAVDI Aquatic Invader is a teacher training and youth education program that's led by Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. And I see that uh, Allison Neubauer and Danielle Woodbrick and Kristen Walker are also on this uh, webinar. And uh, they're helping to lead that effort on behalf of Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. So just a quick shout out to them. The Aquatic Invasive Species Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Point Program is for business, industry, management, and others who work in the field and uh, whose operate, operations and products might potentially spread invasive species. And for more information about how to get involved and discover resources that are supportive of those projects, you can check out those websites. So for today's talk, we'll introduce you to the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers campaign. Uh, it was launched in 2002. Uh, Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers is a national education campaign that was founded in community-based social marketing, which effectively applies proven theories of human behavior. Uh, the campaign is designed to raise awareness and change behaviors, and it was created as a step down to state watershed and local levels uh, so that partners can adapt or adopt resources for distribution within their communities. And to date, over 2,000 partners from business, industry, academia, and nonprofits have joined the campaign. And joining the campaign is free, and there's no obligations. A cornerstone for the campaign are the federally approved guidelines. Shown here are the guidelines for motor boaters. On the left-hand side is a simple communication message, clean, drain, dry, for use in simple communication tools like billboards, signs, key floats, uh, stickers, hats, and other marketing tools. And on the right is the complete education message designed to identify specific actions needed to ensure clean voting. And those sorts of, that sort of information is more conducive for use in fact sheets and in brochures. In addition to this set of guidelines, there's guidelines that are available for other recreational activities, including non-motorized boats, anglers, scuba divers, sailors, personal watercraft users, waterfall hunters, as well as seaplane pilots. 
and all these guidelines are available on the Aquatic and Species Task Force website. Since 2006, Wildlife Forever, the co-manager of the National Campaign, estimates that there's been over 1 billion impressions that have been generated by campaign partners. Key reasons why we've been able to achieve this level of exposure is because we have a very powerful brand, and I'll come back to that in just a second. It sends a very clear, uh, clear message, a uh, prevention message to the public, and we've enlisted partners to be a part of the solution, helping to extend the partnership to audiences that we would not likely have been able to reach uh, by ourselves. And as a result, uh, nearly 2,000 partners have joined. When it comes to Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers campaign, and Minnesota Sea Grant assessments have shown that strategically capitalizing on the brand, the word mark, and the tagline, Clean, Drain, Dry, can not only raise awareness, but also can change behaviors. And based on exposure to campaign in 2006-2007, a face-to-face survey of, of 2,200 voters in three states revealed that 97% plus will take action to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. A really cool result of that survey showed that even if they've not seen the campaign logo and wordmark before, nine out of 10 respondents knew what it meant. In 2010, the Great Lakes Sea Grant Network, led by Minnesota, launched the first comprehensive regional campaign on aquatic invasive species, and funding for the campaign was provided by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Through this campaign, the network produced over 80 new tools and generated 14.5 million exposures, which is 300 times more anticipated based on the proposal. As a part of the campaign, the first regional survey of North American Fishing Club members was conducted in collaboration with the North American Media Group and Wildlife Forever. Our objectives for the survey were to determine if the strategic messaging used in dedicated email newsletters could effectively reach anglers raise their awareness, and also change uh, desired behaviors. From a theory to application approach, uh, could we use a heuristical behavior approach through strategic communication to short circuit the learning process to get anglers exposed to the message to take action? Our approach was the first time it's been tried. We, we used five dedicated e-newsletters that were sent out to 30,000 fish and informer subscribers who live in the Great Lakes states. The five pre-survey e-newsletters featured stop aquatic hitchhikers, with, each with a targeted message of who, what, where, why, and how to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species, and all communicated the message of personal responsibility. One question in the survey we asked was, how important is it that recreational water users take action to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species? Over 97% of the respondents indicated it was very to moderately important to take action. Note that very few respondents felt that aquatic invasive species was somewhat to not important at all. So while some may com uh, uh, claim that anglers don't know about aquatic invasive species in the Great Lakes, these results clearly show that anglers that we surveyed perceive aquatic invasive species as a significant threat. One of the million dollar questions we wanted to ask uh, anglers was about the level of awareness about aquatic invasive species before and after exposure to the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers campaign. Anglers went from 46% very to moderately aware to 96 very to moderately aware following exposure. Again, this shows the value of capitalizing on the campaign's brand to extend prevention messages to outdoor recreations to recreationists to, pr to promote awareness. Well, anglers can have all the information in the world, uh, but uh, it may not necessarily transform into desired behaviors. So we next asked them two questions. Before exposure to the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers campaign, how often did you take action to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species? And we asked them, after exposure to the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers campaign, how, will you, how often will you take action in the future to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species? For comparison, results show, showed a dramatic increase in response to reported behavior change going from 64% always to usually taking action to 97% always to usually taking action. So overall, these results show strategic communication using this heuristical approach can be effective in changing behaviors and reaching a very large audience. One of the areas that I'm particularly interested in is in the motivations behind different audiences and why they do take action and why they don't take action. A key motivation among anglers based on this survey for taking action was a desire to keep aquatic invasive species out of our lakes and rivers, a feeling of personal responsibility and their actions make a difference, social influence and seeing others take action, 
and word of mouth were also important. Also note that in a comparison to a couple of other surveys that we've done back in 2000 and 1994 in Minnesota, that you can see that the motivations behind threats, laws, and enforcement also have increased uh, over time. The main reasons for not taking action that anglers did not transport their boat to other waters and that they were not in entrusted waters. So the good news is that only a small segment of the population do not believe that aquatic invasive species are a problem, that regulations won't work, that they forgot, or that it only takes one mistake to cause an infestation. So hopefully this helps to raise the rest of um, the, the perception that well, some anglers aren't getting the message and others aren't motivated to take action. So we believe that the spread of zebra mussels and aquatic, other aquatic invasive species has been slowed due in part to strategic education in states that have implemented um, the South Aquatic Hitchhikers campaign. And conversely, um, they have spread much more where emphasized, um, where there hasn't been an, as much of an emphasis, at least historically, um, in those states. I'd just like to mention that in Wisconsin and Michigan recently, uh, they have made significant strides in, in public education in part through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding and through the regional approach that we've been using through our Sea Grant project. So in closing, I hope that if you haven't already, please consider uh, joining the fight to help stop aquatic hitchhikers. It's been shown to be effective, and if you do, you'll be helping to reach audiences to help protect waters in your area from the harmful impacts of aquatic invasive species on the environment, recreation, and the economy of communities that depend on healthy lakes and rivers. So with that, thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to Rebecca. Excellent. Thank you, Doug, so much. Now we are uh, at the question and answer uh, portion of our webinar, and we do have a couple of um, questions that have been typed into the chat box. So uh, our first question uh, from Lois Wilson, and before I do that, I'm just going to thank Lois. Uh, Lois Wilson is our uh, uh, network state coordinator for Michigan, and Lois was the person that really helped um, get our excellent speakers uh, into the webinar, so thank you so much, Lois. And she had a question for Peter. When the majority of carp were removed from one lake, what changes were observed in the, in the lake? Um, and she's both food web and water quality changes. It's for Peter. Oh, th thank you. Um, so uh, we've done this now in several lakes, and um, the answer is that about half of them have responded really positively. We've got that published. I could send you some of the, at least one of the publications. Uh, in one case, uh, the uh, people could see the bottom of the lake for the first time that they could ever recall. And it actually was very fortunate. It came back all with native submerged plants and uh, supports quite a good fishery. So that was a huge success story, that lake. That's published in Hydrobiologia now. Uh, another lake, uh, actually, we saw, it sort of depends on the, I don't want to go on too long. A deeper lake, we didn't see such dramatic changes. Um, but we now know, the way I look at it, we now know that there's excessive uh, uh, nutrient loading in these sediments so that they can, they can proceed to address that because the presence of carps negates any effects of, of, of sediment remediation. And the third lake, we saw really dramatic changes too. So overall, pretty positive. Uh, not always, you know, but it's certainly a step that has to be taken to uh, restoring any kind of lake because the carp, they turn the bottom over all the time and you're pretty stuck if you don't get them out. Is that okay? Excellent. Uh, Peter, thank you. Sure. And I think that the next question uh, is, uh, that's not mine, <laughs> it's mine, is from, uh, for, from Doug for Ashley on quag mussels. I think that was yours, Doug, right? If you just want to go ahead and ask that. Yes, yeah, so um, this is a this is a great question. Um, I am not familiar. I've not heard this estimate myself, and I'd be interested to hear from Doug where where he heard it. So to be put on the spot though about confirming and commenting on it, I did do a back of the envelope calculation, and I came up with more something more in the hundreds of trillions numbers of mussels. So the 720 quadrillion isn't too far off from a, a simple estimate, but I, before I am willing to confirm that, I'd have to know more about where I found out, because there are a lot of different methods we use for scaling up biomass and the density to the whole lake. 
Um, so yeah, that that's the it's within range. I think it's a plausible number. I would go as far as to say that. Okay, thanks, Ashley, and for our uh, we webinar viewers that will be joining us after the session uh, using the NorthCentralWater.org link. I will just repeat the question, which is um, that. Uh, 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 Doug had heard that quagga mussels in Lake Michigan have blossomed to something like a total of 700 or 720 quadrillion. Based on that number, uh, an estimate pegs the fil filtration rate based on lake volume to be every 9 to 11 days. Can you confirm this and comment? So Ashley was able to do that. Uh, okay. Uh, I had a question. <laughs> um, I had a question. For Ashley, um, is there anything, Ashley, that you can tell us about predictions for nearshore algae blooms based on your research? And forgive me if I you said something and I missed it because I'm multitasking. Here, oh, but, no, that, that's uh, fine. Any information that you have on that for us? So with my research, I've largely focused on what's happening in the offshore effects of mussels. So I, I can comment on your question, but I have to say I'm very much representing other people's research when I do. Um, so there are a few mechanisms where mussels could facilitate harmful algal blooms, um, and that's largely because mussels can um, make more nutrients available in the nearshore area that could be taken up and used by the harmful algae. And then also mussels selectively, um, well, they'll actually avoid eating the harmful algae. So that will essentially uh, concentrate harmful algae in the water and help them be more dominant over the other uh, more preferred algae species for the, the mussels to eat. So through those mechanisms, there is a potential for them to um, maybe make it more likely for harmful algae blooms, but that's still very much a um, lot of research needs to be done there, but those be the mechanisms. Thank you, Ashley. Mm -hmm. Okay, other other questions from our audience? Okay, you're going to give me the floor again. So I'm going to ask another question for Doug. And uh, Doug, I, it seemed like, um, again, uh, given that I might miss some details uh, in, in the organization here, did your your research look like it was mostly self-reporting um, of of people responding to what their behaviors might be? Is, is that is that the case? Uh, and if so, you know, are you looking at other research um, that would uh, more effectively, or not more effectively, but document uh, behavior change in a different way? Yeah, that's a great question. And all the surveys that we've been done have been. Um, you know, sort of place-based uh, and situational surveys. So they've been through the mail, um, they've been through face-to-face -face surveys, and now through this last survey that I just presented, of course, through the internet. Um, there's been a lot of discussions with social scientists about uh, this self-reporting issue and whether or not it's truthful. Um, I've talked with um, natural resource survey designers for years, and they tend to believe that surveys that revolve around um, natural resource issues that people are, are pretty honest about responding to that. Um, there's always going to be a certain amount of bias depending upon which type of uh, assessment tool that you use. When it comes to uh, taking direct observations of people apparently taking actions to water access, it's very difficult to discern what their intentions of their actions are. So for example, if you're watching me uh, clean up or walk around my boat motor and trailer at the at the end of the day coming off of Lake Superior, you may not be able to determine based on my actions whether the actions were specifically for safety purposes or if they were specific to um, taking action to prevent aquatic invasive species unless you saw me actually remove aquatic vegetation or maybe uh, pull the drain plug from my boat. So it's, uh, it's uh, a, an area that needs more exploration and more research. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Um, 
Okay, uh, we are at the end of our time. And again, I want to uh, thank our presenters for their excellent presentations and remind everyone that they will be archived. The presentations will be archived, not the presenters. Uh, they will be archived on northcentralwater.org. Uh, our next uh, webinar will be November 19th, again at 2 p.m. Central Time. And it's, uh, it's called the 21st Century Extension Educator Resources for Multi-State Collaboration. So while, while many of us are already engaged in multi-state collaboration, um, uh, some uh, educators that are working more at the local level may wonder, um, you know, what uh, what's all involved in, in doing that? How much time does it take? When is it worth my while? And, and um, what are some uh, resources available to, to make the best use of my time? So that that is, uh, will be the topic of our, our next webinar. And uh, we welcome you to join us. And again, thank you so much to our presenters. And have a good afternoon. <laughs>